Jayek. Welcome back to our Braiding Sweetgrass uh, book club. Uh, I hope you're having a wonderful day. I think we are on our 14th episode, um, so we are getting there. So like always, I smudge before we start just so that we can um, make sure we are grounded and um, not multitasking, which my brain is trying to do to me right now. So I, um, we're going to smudge, get grounded. I like to sit cross-legged, but whatever works for you. Um, and we're just going to take a couple big deep breaths to just get grounded. And so we're ready to really focus on these next two chapters in braiding sweetgrass. So now we're just going to relax, let our bellies relax, our throats relax, two big deep breaths. Nice. Let's begin. Okay, now we are on the old growth children, um, starting on page 277. Now I want to read this paragraph and I really want to know what you think about it. Fluted trunks rise from a lawn of deep moss green, their canopies lost in the hanging mist that suffuses the forest with hazy silver twilight. Strewn with huge logs and clumps of ferns, the forest floor is a feather bed of needles, dappled with sun flecks. Light streams through the holes over the heads of young trees, while their grandmothers loom in the shadows. Great buttresses of trunks, eight feet in diameter. You want to be quiet, in instinctive defer deference to the cathedral hush, and because nothing you could possibly say would add a thing. Um, I love that in this, Robin talks about the forest as if they're a family. Um, the grandmothers, the big giant trees watching over um, the new saplings. It's not just that she gives spirit to the trees and to the forest. She has a familial line. And I think that is incredibly to the heart of the entire book. Um, in my opinion, not just our relationship with nature, but the relationship that nature has with itself. That it's not just, you know, we believe that everything has a spirit and the trees have a spirit and they're, they're all beings, but also they're a family and the family line is there and apparent. And there are no words to describe the witnessing of the family there in the forest. Um, and so I thought that was incredibly beautiful. And if you notice that theme throughout the book, everything is tied to family and relationships and that reciprocity that she always, always is talking about throughout the book. It's a pretty common theme. So also my apologies. I just realized I was recording with the camera upside down. That is how um, this Monday has been going for me. Um, so sorry about that. We'll just switch things up a little bit. And um, no, it's just totally my fault. My apologies. Um, but reading this chapter, um, Robin has been talking about her um, basically interview with a guy named, sorry, Frank, um, who in his 50s has... Uh, decided to help heal the land in the way that he know in any way he can. Um, so up until this point, Robin has been talking about the deforestation of the, the redwoods in northwestern US all the way up through Canada and into Alaska. That whole chain used to be nothing but um, rainforest of cedars, maples, um, and you know, the, I think the sequoias, the, uh-huh, the big redwoods. Um, and so she's talking about the deforestation of all of that. And then she's met this gentleman named Frank. And I want to read you this paragraph. 
So he wrote a journal through all of this. Um, and then he also ha has, he thought he was gonna um, retire and grow old with his wife on this farm that he had built. And that didn't end up happening. They, they got a divorce. He had to leave the farm and sell it. Um, so now he's bought a, pot, a patch of land um, in the heart of the Oregon Range, or Oregon Coast Range, the same mountain where his grandfather had made a hard scramble homestead. Old family photos show a rough cabin and grim faces surrounded by nothing but stumps. He wrote, Frank wrote, these 40 acres were to be my retreat, my escape to the wild, but this was no pristine wilderness. The place he chose was near a spot on the map called Burnt Woods, scalped woods would have been more apt. The land was raised by a series of clear cuts, first the venerable old forest and then its children. No sooner had the firs grown back than the loggers came for them again. After land is clear cut, everything changes. Sunshine is suddenly abundant. The soil had been broken open by logging equipment, raising its temperature and exposing mineral soil beneath the hummus blanket. The clock of ecological succession has been reset. The alarm buzzing loudly. Um, this was a huge statement for her. You know, so many people just think that, oh, you cut down trees, they'll grow right back. They don't understand just the damage. it When they wipe everything out, um, it changes everything. Um, the the trees that provided shade for all the undergrowth and the, and the life that grows there is gone. And I didn't realize the depths of it until I read this book and then just did some research. Um, so that is a huge thing we need to realize as well. And even, you know, they can go in and do what's called selective cutting where they'll just go in and, and cut down the trees that are really old or maybe are too crowded or are diseased and it leaves room for the other trees, that's maybe a little bit better, but it still, is that is that an honorable harvest? I don't know, I don't know about that one. Now Robin goes on to explain a little bit more and I want to read it. Forest ecosystems have tools for dealing with massive disturbance evolved from a history of blowdown, landslide, and fire. The early successional plant species arrive immediately and get to work on damage control. These plants, known as opportunistic or pioneer species, have adaptations that allow them to thrive after disturbances. Because resources like light and space are plentiful, they grow quickly. A patch of bare ground around here can disappear in a few weeks. Their goal is to grow and reproduce as fast as possible, so they don't bother themselves with making trunks, but rather madly invest in leaves, leaves, and more leaves, born on the flimsiest of stems. The key to success is to get more of everything than your neighbor and to get it faster. That life strategy works when resources seem to be infinite. But pioneer species, not unlike pioneer humans, require cleared land, hard work, individual initiative, and numerous children. In other words, the window of opportunity for opportunistic species is short. Once trees arrive on the scene, the pioneers' days are numbered, so they use their photosynthetic wealth to make babies that will be carried by birds to the next clear cut. As a result, many are berry makers, salmonberry, elderberry, huckleberry, and blackberry. Um, this was really interesting because um, I didn't notice this, that that's why. Anyway, so when we, we moved here and we bought a few acres in Tennessee and the previous owner had clear cut about an acre of land and then used that, um, the money that he used for the lumber to pay to build the house. Um, but the whole area that was clear cut is surrounded by blackberries. Um, nowhere else in the woods can you find any blackberries at all, but everywhere that's clear cut or that was clear cut, um, is just loaded with dewberries and blackberries. 
And I didn't, I had no idea that um, that's why, that once it was clear cut, the opportunistic blackberries came in and a whole bunch of other things as well. So I found that really, really interesting. So now Robin is getting back to, um, and I'm sorry, I've been calling him Frank, it's Franz, um, back to Franz's journal. So Franz's journals recall that when he compared the fragment of old growth he could see in the distance with the raw land at Shot Pouch, where the only remnant of the ancient forest was an old cedar log, he knew he had found his purpose. Displaced from his own vision of how the world should be, he vowed that he would heal this place and return it to what it was meant to be. My goal, he wrote, is to plant an old growth forest. But his ambitions ranged beyond physical restoration. As Franz wrote, it is important to engage in restoration with development of a personal relationship with the land and its living things. In working with the land, he wrote of the loving relationship that grew between them. It was as if I discovered a lost part of myself. Um, I have noticed whenever I've gone through, and we all go through them, the low points in our life, that giving back or service, I, I'm not really sure of the right word, um, immersion into work of helping others, not like work in an office work, but immer immersing yourself in work that's heart-to-heart -heart connection with another human or animal or forest of another being has been what has healed me. Um, and I'm glad that um, I'm not alone in that. And Franz has taught me that in this book. Okay, so now Franz has gone on to, um, he's planting seedlings in the forest around his property or on the property that he's purchased to, um, to, re to reseed back into an old forest. So his journals make it clear that there were times when he doubted the wisdom of his endeavors. He recognized that no matter what he did, the land would eventually turn back to some sort of forest whether he slogged up hills with a sack of seedlings or not. Human time is not the same as forest time, but time alone is no guarantee of the old growth forest he imagined. When the surrounding la landscape is a mosaic of clear cut and Douglas fir lawns, it is not necessarily possible for a natural forest to reassemble itself. Where would the seeds come from? Would the land be in a condition to welcome them? Okay, so I'm going to read more on page 288. Cedar family is especially evocative of how cedar often lives in family-like groves. Perhaps in compensation for its difficulty in sprouting from seed, cedar is a champion at vegetative reproduction. Almost any part of the tree that rests on wet ground can take root in a process known as layering. The low swooping foliage may send roots into moist beds of moss. The flexible branches themselves can initiate new trees, even after they're cut from a tree. Native peoples probably tended the cedar groves by propagating them in this way. Even a young cedar that has tipped over or been flattened by a hungry elk will reorient its branches and start over. The Aboriginal names for the tree, long life maker and tree of life are appropriately bestowed. Um, I did not know that about cedar, but it does make sense. When um, you know that cedar is one of our four sacred medicines, we have sage, tobacco, sweet grass, of course, and then and cedar. And cedar is like, it's our balancer, it keeps us. So like if we smudge with cedar, it's to keep us balanced and protective. Um, so we've already, so for example, we've already cleansed all of the ick away with sage. The cedar will, 
form like a protection, a purification um, to keep us safe. Like if I know I'm going into a bad area or if I have to go through a cemetery or I'm just not sure of, like if I have to go to a party and I know icky people are gonna be there, I will actually put a little bit of cedar in my shoes to just, to keep that protection. But also cedar offers that protection if you can make it into a tea. And it does the same thing, but on the physical body. Um, it adds in that purification. Many of our elders, if we have the flu or we're sick, they immediately give us some cedar tea for that purification to help cleanse the body. So in more ways than one, cedar heals. And it sounds like that's what was Franz was after, was that healing. And Cedar gave it to him without him even knowing about it. Okay, I have this one paragraph on page 289. It's a very short paragraph. One of the most touching place names on Franz's map is a spot he called Old Growth Children. To plant trees is an act of faith. 13,000 acts of faith live on this land. That was beautiful. And going on to page 289, Cedar's generosity extends not only to people, but to many other forest dwellers as well. Its, its tender, low-hanging foliage is among deer and elk's favorite food. You'd think that seedlings hidden under the canopies of everything else would be camouflaged, but they are so palatable that the herbivores hunt them out as if they were hidden chocolate bars. And because they grow so slowly, they remain vulnerable at deer height for a long time. That is true. A lot of times when you see cedar trees and they're like, there's nothing growing from like until you hit about five feet. and. That's why deer and elk love them. Now, the last paragraph of this chapter, I wanna read that for you, page 292. Outside the door of his cabin, the circle of young cedars look like women in green shawls, beaded with raindrops catching the light, graceful dancers in feathery fringe that sways with their steps. They spread their branches wide, opening the circle, inviting us to be part of the dance of regeneration, clumsy at first. From generations of sitting on the sidelines, we stumble until we find the rhythm. We know these steps from deep memory, handed down from Sky Woman, reclaiming our responsibility as co-creators. Here in a homemade forest, poets, writers, scientists, foresters, shovels, seeds, elk, and elder join in the circle with Mother Cedar, dancing the old growth children into being. We are all invited. Pick up a shovel and join the dance. Now we're moving on to Witness to the Rain, and that is on page 293. And I want to read this paragraph. Most other places I know, water is a discrete entity. It is hemmed in by well-defined boundaries, lake shores, stream, banks, the great rocky coastline. You can stand at its edge and say, this is water and this is land. Those fish and those tadpole, tadpoles are of the water realm. These trees, these mosses, and these four-leggeds are creatures of the land. But here in these misty forests of those edges seem to blur with rain so fine and constant as to be indistinguishable from air and cedars wrapped with cloud so dense that only their outlines emerge. Water doesn't seem to make a clear distinction between gaseous phase and liquid. The air merely touches a leaf or a tendril of my hair and suddenly a drop appears. I wanted to read that because again, Robin's so poetic in her words and her descriptions. And I was just really touched by that paragraph. I felt like I was there in the rainforest with her. I really wish I was. Okay, now I wanna read um, the end of 297 going into 298. 
Alder leaves lie fallen on the gravel, their drying edges upturned to form leafy cups. Rainwater has pooled in several and is stained red-brown like tea from the tannins leached from the leaf. Strands of lichen lie scattered among them where the wind has torn them free. I suddenly, suddenly I see the experiment. I need to test my hypothesis. The materials are neatly laid out before me. I find two strands of lichen equal in size and length and blot them on my flannel shirt inside my raincoat. One strand I place in the leaf cup of red alder tea. The other I soak in a pool of pure rainwater. Slowly I lift them both up side by side and watch the droplets form at the end of the strands. Sure enough, they are different. The plain water forms small rapid drops that seem in a hurry to let go, but the droplets steeped in alder water grow large and heavy and then hang for a long moment before gravity pulls them away. I feel the grin spreading over my face with the aha moment. There are different kinds of drops, depending on the relationship between the water and the plant. If tannin-rich alder water increases the size of the drops, might not water seeping through a long curtain of moss also pick up tannins, making the big, strong drops I thought I was seeing? One thing I've learned in the woods is that there is no such thing as random. Everything is steeped in meaning, colored by relationships, one thing with another. So there again, Robin is bringing things back about the relationships. And just this is the relationship of water and water drops and how it reacts to certain um, elements in nature and how everything is related. Um, every, everything has a consequence of another, you know? I really like to know your thoughts as well, so drop them in the comments and let's let's discuss. Okay, we're gonna finish up um, on page two ninety nine into three hundred. Listening to rain, time disappears. If time is measured by the period between events, alder drip time is different from maple drip. This forest is textured with different kinds of time as the surface of the pool is dimpled with different kinds of rain. Fir needles fall with the high frequency hiss of rain. Branches fall with the boink of big drops. And trees fall with a rare but thunderous thud. Rare, unless you measure time like a river. And we think of it as simply time, as if it were one thing, as if we understood it. Maybe there is no such thing as time. There are only moments, each with its own story. I can see my face reflected in a dangling drop. The fish eye lens gives me a giant forehead and tiny ears. I suppose that's the way we humans are. Thinking too much and listening too little. Paying attention acknowledges that we have something to learn from, intelligence other than our own. Listening, standing witness, creates an openness to the world in which the boundaries between us can dissolve in a raindrop. The drop swells on the tip of a cedar, and I catch it on my tongue like a blessing. And with that, we are going to wrap up this episode of our Braiding Sweetgrass um, book series book club. Um, next week, we'll be going into a pretty heavy uh, chapter. Um, she's going to start talking about the Wendigo. Now, normally, I don't like to talk about the Wendigo during um, when it's not winter time. Um, but I'm going to do my very best. Um, and if there's just something in here that um, I think you should read, but I don't want to read it out loud 
or so that it can be played during a non-winter time. Um, I'll let you know like what page it's on and what paragraph. Um, I think for the most part, there isn't anything that I can't or don't feel comfortable reading, but if I do, I'll just let you know. Um, for the Anishinaabe people, the Wendigo is very, very real. Um, some people call it a superstition. Some people call it a lesson. Um, some people are just very, very careful. And I'm one of those very, very careful, don't want to mess with certain things kind of people. So um, if you don't know what the Wendigo is, you can look it up on the internet. Um, it's a scary uh, creature that gobbles up greedy people. Um, and we just, we're allowed to talk about it. Our elders were, you know, during the winter time, we all gather around and that's when we have storytelling time and we can talk about the spirits and that sort of thing because they're sleeping. They're not sleeping right now. So you don't want to bring attention to yourself. I hope that makes sense. If you're not Anishinaabe, it's, and, uh, it might not make a lot of sense. Anyway, so next week we'll be going into that. If you don't feel comfortable talking or listening or even hearing about the Wendigo, feel free to skip. Totally up to you. Um, but I do feel like it really ties Robin's book in. Um, and as well as the Seven Fire Prophecies. If you don't know what that is either, Google Anishinaabe Seven Fire Prophecies. Um, and I, I believe in that as well. So on that note, I'm going to end this and leave you. I hope you have a wonderful week. If the sun is out, go enjoy it. Give thanks to the sunrise and the grandmother moon. And remember to protect your joy and your peace. And we'll see you next week. Bama P. For every Indigenous Author Monday video that I put out, I am dedicating it to the One Shelf Project put on by Gadakana. Gadakana is an Indigenous organization, a 501c3 nonprofit, tax deductible organization that provides books in their local libraries that are actually accurate, historically accurate, and by Indigenous authors both fiction and nonfiction. And their goal is to at least have a shelf dedicated to indigenous accurate information in their local libraries. They can only do this with help through donors and they need your help. I will put the link down here. So please check them out. The One Shelf Project, another organization near and dear to my heart. Gadakana.